It is my pleasure now to bring up uh, Nico Sell. She uh, does wear sunglasses. I should tell you, it's getting bright in here. She's not wearing them for those reasons. She has never been photographed, I am told, without her sunglasses on anywhere on the internet. Is that absolutely, is that true? So that's a thing. For you. You, you, she does all the panels and presentations with the glasses on. And I should show you, she gave me this before this morning, uh, which she told me I should put my cell phone in. We should all have these, I think, mm -hmm. apparently. And if I put my phone in here, it can't be hacked? Is that what, well, what goes uh, on in here? No, so it'll stop GPS signal. So right now, there's no other way, right? Your location at every given moment is being tracked. So if you're going to, go in to meet with a source, right. For instance, this is a good thing. Put it in there. Do you do you walk around with your phone in here? Uh, yeah, I have one for my phone and one for my wallet. I think for everyone in this room, it's more important for your passport and your RFID credit cards. It's very easy to clone those from long distances at this point. So, help us uh, with this. You just heard the conversation that we just had um, about the risks and the way the government thinks about it. Mm -hmm. From your perspective, biggest risks that everybody out here should be thinking about? Um, the biggest risk to my friends and family, I think all of us, are the data brokers, more than the NSA or the other 70 nation states that have very active spying programs. Um, there's a reason why the government went to these companies for help. They're the masters of surveillance, and they're not um, The data watched. brokers being? Well, Experian would be the worst of them, I would say. You know, they're selling lists of rape victims and erectile sufferers for seven cents a piece. Um, I'm, I'm speechless. Uh, <laughs> Cops addresses, they took that down now. But and they it, sell it to identity thieves. So you're not worried, I mean one of the things is very selfish, but I imagine people uh, everywhere worry that one day they're going to wake up in the morning and either their email is going to be completely and utterly hacked and everybody's going to have it, or worse, they're going to uh, log into their bank account and whatever the number used to be is going to be zero. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I think with Michael Litton we saw, right, I mean, I was happy that I do all of my board conversations on Wicker because even Spiegel and Snapchat and Michael, I mean, all of their board conversations were leaked. And I would say that is one of the biggest threats to everyone in this room is your email servers. These are databases of gold and they're stored around forever. And think of what you can tell from an email server. Everything about what's going on in a company. And I think we need to start thinking about there are some things that need to live forever. There are some things that need to live for seven years. But most of the conversations that you have don't need to live that long. And the less time that they live, and the fewer servers that they're on, the more secure right. they'll be. And your Wicker system, just so everybody understands, is a fully encrypted system. The government's not happy about that system. Yeah, they're not happy about that. Um, and especially because we, um, yeah, the DOJ can't read our messages. Um, hacking team, I don't know how, how much you guys know about them, but they're like the uber hackers in the world and governments all over hire them uh, to break into companies and technology and their email server was just hacked and put on the internet and it showed that the U.S. government was interested in getting into Wicker, but they hadn't yet. Who, when you think, I mean we keep talking about the Chinese, um, he made a very persuasive case about uh, some very interesting uh, things that I didn't really appreciate, frankly, uh, that are going on in the Middle East. Wh uh -huh. Where do you see the biggest risk? And I know you uh -huh. talked about Experian, but beyond, b beyond that. Beyond so, that. Yeah, I thought it was interesting with John, you didn't mention the word long term at all. Because I really think that's where him and I differ. We're both out there trying to catch bad guys, and I commend everything that him and his team are doing. But everything was a current case right now. And one of my favorite long-term thinkers is George Washington. And one of the things that he did was establish the U.S. Post Office. And the U.S. Post Office was di different from the British Post Office in two ways. He said, we refuse to spy on our citizens, and we refuse to censor, our, censor their information. And this is how we have strong society and strong social discourse. And I believe this is one of the things that made America great. Actually, the New York Times wrote a piece about it. And he was thinking very long term. And the reason why America can be strong and beloved is because we give these basic human rights to everyone, no matter what frontier, and create a strong society for all of us. Tell me this, and I shouldn't do this to myself since you are a hacker and you would know how to do it. I said before I'm double authenticated on Gmail, so I think that I'm safe. If you really wanted to hack me, what would you do? 
How would you do it? People always say that they're going to brute force. They're going to brute force your yeah. pastor. I don't understand what that means. But just <laughs> lay it in, in sort of very simple terms for everyone to understand. So um, the easiest way to hack you. Uh, we've got a great contest that we do at DEF CON every year that Chris Hagnagy runs. It's the social engineering contest. And they get 100% of the targets 100% of the time. They use two main tools: the phone and Facebook. Facebook alone. You can socially engineer your way into giving, getting information from someone that you need to then do other things to get a foothold in and go beyond that. For you personally, the biggest hack that I've seen with journalists and something that we taught the kids how to do last year <laughs> is how to turn on the interfacing camera on your TV, your smartphone, and your computer. This is not NSA level stuff. We also taught them how to eavesdrop on your cell phone calls for $500 in a backpack. Yes, we teach kids to do that. So this has all gone very mainstream. Hold on, hold on. <laughs> um, you can turn the camera on. So I have a, a MacBook um, Air with the camera on it. Mm -hmm. You can just turn that on. Mm -hmm. That's easy. Fairly easy. How easy? It's happened what, to some of your reporters. What do you have to do to do it? Um, well, you have to find a, a hole in the system and get in there and, and turn the camera on. Um, there's lots of different holes. Do you in put? I, ways. I've been told that people put tape on those cameras. Do you do that? Uh, yeah, I've actually got some stickers. I'll give to you if you come by and say hi to me. It's fancy electrical tape. It goes through about 30 selfies, I think, on and off of your. And that's really easy. That's something all of us can do, right? That doesn't take. It doesn't isn't a huge step for you to have a little bit more security. But there's no other way around that right now besides electrical tape. Very advanced. Okay, wait, give us some other self-help things. I didn't realize <laughs> we were going to go into this direction, but I didn't. I didn't appreciate how. Um, so the other big one I think for all of us is um, how many of you have put your birth date and your birthplace up on the internet? I noticed Al Gore did actually in our, uh, our little um, briefing description there. With those two pieces of information alone, there's been researchers at Carnegie Mellon, Alice, Alessandro Acquaziti, that have been able to guess social security numbers with very high accuracy on just those two pieces of information alone. And what gets scary there is then they sell your health identity on the black market to some mother whose kid is dying who needs health insurance. And what happens then is your blood records get switched and people die. Final question for you. <laughs> uh, you know, I mentioned Edward Snowden earlier when we were talking to John and, and the implications for business. You look at him as somebody who is a hero a villain? What's the, what's the thinking inside the community at this point? Um, so I try to not put as much of a judgment on the man himself. I haven't met him, but I think what he's done for our society is amazing. Um, we've started to wake up to some of the things that are going on. Um, only the tip of the iceberg again that right. he's shown us. Um, but is society better off for him? Definitely. I said that was a final question, but let me ask you one more thing. <laughs> um, we have all given away so much of our privacy whether it's on Facebook or on Google, uh, in exchange effectively for free product, right? Okay. Free services. We get our email for free. We get Evernote for all of these things. Well, Evernote has a premium service. But there, we get a lot of stuff for free uh -huh. by giving away stuff. You've made the argument before that that's going to change and uh -huh. shift. And I'm trying to understand what you think the trigger will be that will get people there, given uh -huh. that free, uh, you know, people love free. Um, why did people start wearing skinny jeans again instead of bell bottoms? It's the same thing. So the generation before overreacts to the generation below. So one of the nonprofits I run teaches kids 8 through 16 how to hack, ethically, of course. And what we've seen with this group of kids is that, that they think the generation before them is ridiculous for sharing all of their information for free. And the changes happen naturally even without my help. Nico, thank you. Appreciate it very, Thank very you. much. Great.